going to share now. Oh, shit, this is still... Uh... So, uh, wait. We're live? Uh, so, uh, welcome to the 45th Nerd Night, and uh, our first digital Nerd Night. Sorry for the delay, we got some copyright issues with uh, YouTube, which caused uh, a bit of stress at the last minute. Um, uh, unfortunately, we cannot do it live. I can hear somebody try to speak in the Zoom chat. So, uh, first of first, uh, can you mute? Because I can hear myself, which is annoying. It's delayed. Manu. Manu. Can you, can you shut up? This is really annoying to me. I cannot. Manu, can you mute? Okay, I muted you. Okay, now I can see. Uh, sorry for that. Um, I heard a very slow echo of myself, constantly talking to myself. Um, that was really annoying, so I had to get rid of that. Um, so, uh, what? Sending out the virtual hug. For the for the for for the first week of uh, of, uh, of of isolation, um, because uh, not speaking to poor people really was really getting to me. Um, but eventually, uh, like all other people, I got used to uh, communicating video chat and socializing through video chat and doing coffee meetings, virtual meetings, gaming with video chat, and even board, real life board games through video chat. Um, I can only advise this if you have a good setup with cameras, but it is actually not as clunky as you would might think. And it's really fun. Um, so I will give an overview of what happened this evening for me. We will start off with Gara, who will, uh, uh, will teach us how we can use AI and deep learning um, to, uh, 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 to help with the surveillance of disease and, and figure out. Or, uh, 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 I get so confused by doing this. <laughs> uh, um, okay, sorry. And then we have a quiz um, um, uh, presented by our own Manu. Um, and after the quiz, um, I will give a, I will have a talk uh, about uh, the Spanish flu. And uh, lastly, but not leastly, we will have Sandrine, who will talk about uh, how we can use bacteria for good. Um, and so first I want to give words to, uh, but not stage, but digital stage to Gaurav, who will talk about uh, 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 real-time AI. In Thank you for the amazing introduction. Um, can I get a thumbs up if you can hear me? All right, excellent. Okay, so I am audible. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Um, I'm, uh, I'm going to try to blow through what's going to be a very wide ranging talk in about half an hour. Um, so let's 
not waste too much time. So let me start with this. And, and by the end of this talk, you should have at least some idea why I put these two things together in the same screen. Uh, I'm sure most of you have seen the movie Interstellar. There's the black hole simulation in Interstellar, and there's figuring out who doesn't have enough food in Yemen due to the Civil War. And two very different problems, but you know, one of the wonderful things about mathematics, you dig deep enough and you'll find lots and lots of different similar, uh, you'll find lots of similarities. And we're gonna talk about those tonight. Um, now a little bit about me, and then I'll get into the outline. I used to be the lead data scientist at the United Nations World Food Program. Um, a lot of the um, stuff that we're talking about tonight is comes out of the work I did over there, trying to figure out how do we uh, estimate populations of people that may not have enough food, or maybe um, you know maybe their wages are extremely depressed due to economic crises. Uh, when you know you cannot get that information, say in a time of war, and now in the time of COVID, right, where you cannot actually go and survey populations in real time. Um, and we're going to talk about quite a few things. But there's going to be a bit of math to lay the groundwork, and then we can go from there. Um, and that's the first part. The second is kind of getting into that core topic of surveys. And the third part, the piece de la resistance, is actually estimating COVID-19 infection rates. Um, I'm sure some of you at least have seen the recent work going around from Imperial College, and that's done by Seth Flaxman. And he uh, is a, a collaborator of mine who, uh, who worked with me at the, at the World, at World Food Program on some of these very topics. All right, so without much further ado, um, right, so let's talk about what these two things have in common, right? And, and then one thing I want you to get out of it is information cost. It is extremely high. Uh, you know, if you want to simulate a black hole, you have to do numerical relativity, and you're talking about running a supercomputer, which may cost thousands of dollars per hour to run over many days to actually just get the results that you see in that picture, right? And so it's really hard unless you're, a, you know, a Hollywood movie with a $250 million budget. And similarly, right, with surveys, let's say doing the survey in Yemen, um, the World Food Program spent over $1 million, right, surveying people on the ground, putting them in, you know, getting tanks or getting helmets and bulletproof vests and all the other security equipment necessary to put people there uh, to make sure that their security is, is, is taken care of, uh, given that, you know, there's an ongoing conflict over there. So, so doing surveys in such a situation is very difficult. Um, the original image that the black hole was based off of is this NASA Chandra X-ray Observatory image. Uh, that satellite costs $1.65 billion to put up. Of course, I don't know what the cost would be for a single image, but definitely in the millions of dollars. Um, and, uh, and the point is they both have very low resolution, right? Even after spending all that money, the best we can do for, um, you know, given the instruments we have, one is a you know, really expensive space camera, the other is, you know, uh, hundreds of people with boots on the ground and a whole enumeration team surveying individuals in Yemen is, are these very low resolution images, right? So this is just kind of government level estimates in a pretty wide confidence interval of, you know, what is the prevalence of food insecurity in each of these areas, right? So it's really not good enough. <sighs> and so this leads us to the next thing. And now we're going to get into a bit of math and I'm Extremely sorry if I scared anyone, but bear with me, it's not going to be too bad, right? Um, oftentimes, let's say, let's take the image of the black hole, right? You're interested, you know, there's a lot of things that are going on. And, uh, you know, what you see over here is the event horizon and then the, the, the kind of interesting part of this image, and there's just a random factoid, is you're seeing behind the black hole as well because of the gravitational lensing. This is why numerical relativity is so difficult. Um, and the, there's all kinds of things, right? There's gas in, in the image. There's different particles in the image. There, there may be you know, flares from different parts of light or the camera, et cetera. Um, but you, what you really care about is what is the average value of, let's say, the luminosity at a particular point, right? Um, and similarly, uh, for the survey, right, we, we you know, there, there's, of course, hundreds of different of, of variables that could describe a person, a household, and where they live, we really don't care about the expectation, right? The average. And so that's what we've written down at the bottom, right? That is that bottom equation over there. It's just, what is the average? If you look at the summation, right? One over W, um, 
this part over here, we're just taking the weighted average of the function at those data points, right? Um, and those data points arise out of how you're sampling the um, over that surface, right? Over your points in space and time, right? If you're or or in space, if you're uh, doing a survey in Yemen, and of course, black holes is all about space time. <sighs> so what's kind of interesting, and and is that you know when you have a very difficult integral, um, you know what we can do is actually compute it, compute the value of that integral um, using the mean, right? Using this value of using this idea of expectation. So this is a quick example, right? So say you have this octahedron, and now if you just use uh, you know, the very simple trigonometry we all learned, uh, you would understand that geometry, sorry, uh, that the volume is four thirds, right? But um, say we don't want to do that. We're just really lazy, okay? And we don't want to deal with all the math of computing the value of that octahedron. So we're just gonna have this really simple function, which is the value of the function is one if it's inside the octahedron, and the value is zero if it's outside the octahedron, okay? And let's say the total volume is of course that unit circle that surrounds that octahedron. So if we just go ahead and get that thing going, right? And we just say, okay, take a random point, tell me if it's one or zero, what's the probability if it's one or zero, which is of course one over N, all the number of points that you're shooting out. This is like the dartboard method. Just think of, I'm just throwing darts into that octahedron and seeing are they inside the octahedron or not. Sooner or later, uh, my answer is going to converge to the right answer, right? I'm going to get to the answer of four thirds. Now, usually it takes about 10,000 iterations. Uh, it could be more. Uh, but the idea is with really difficult integrals, I can just use this very simple technique of, let me just compute the mean, right? Um, of, you know, just taking random shots into that volume and seeing what comes out. So <clears throat> let's go back to our example of black holes and the, uh, and, and our survey in Yemen, right? So we have these points, and these are these alphas over here, right? And these are the points that we want to sample at. And so we sampled at these points, and uh, now we observe some Fs, right? We observe the outcome at that point, right? So uh, maybe I did a simulation, a really expensive numerical relativity sim simulation, and I observed the luminosity, or I looked at my Chandra X-ray telescope, and I looked at the, the luminosity from there. I sent an enumerator on the ground in Yemen, um, and so I have that, uh, and now I really want to know something about F, right? So I'm going to presume that the black hole, my survey is just some function F. How do I figure out what that is, right? Well, now we're going to do, um, a neat little trick and I'm going to do a lot of hand waving in the mathematical sense, but the biggest, but the, the takeaway over here is that we're just going to say that F that function that's describing the black hole or that's describing the survey in Yemen is just a random variable, right? And it's a realization of all the possible functions that can describe that random, right? Of that family of random variables, right? And we presume that that family of random variables is just any n-dimensional multivariate normal distribution. So say you have a thousand observations. I, my family F that describes those thousand observations um, is all 1,000 dimensional multivariate normal distributions. And I hope I haven't lost anyone over here. Um, just say you have two observations. What you see in the picture is a two dimensional multivariate normal, right? If you have three, four, you just scale this up into many dimensions, but we've all seen you know, the bell curve. And now what's really cool is we have, um, we now have a technique, right? To compute the integral uh, very effectively over a black hole, right? So uh, what we're going to do is just take that family, uh, what we said over here, right? So that family of, of, of multivariate distributions, right? Uh, and just plug that in, right? Into our previous expert, into our previous, uh, very, into our previous function that we had, right? Um, and what we end up getting is actually an analytic solution that gives us both mean and variance. So basically, not knowing much at all about this, this black hole or, or my survey in Yemen. Let's say I just have three data points, okay? I can plug in, I, get, I have those three data points. I put that into this function. I come back with some other function. And now I'm able to say, hey, for my fourth data point, uh, tell me the mean and variance of the 
n-dimensional multivariate normal distribution that describes that function that is the survey the epic, right? And congratulations, you've just learned one of the most advanced topics that you can probably get into in Bayesian statistics, which is Gaussian quadrature. And if you don't get everything, that's not, it's okay. It's not the, the, uh, the main takeaway over here. Um, but the main takeaway is that we can actually now use that information since we know variance, right? Once I put in, and we can actually say, hey, let's choose the next best point right, as I'm going about trying to figure out my integral, that will give me the greatest amount of information gain, okay? Um, and so let's see this in action, right? So here we are, our three observations, right? And we're like, here's just one example of a multivariate normal distribution that fits those three observations. And the integral, right, the area underneath that is what we see over here, right? And now let's just, we're just going to keep on adding all the other possible, uh, you know, uh, instantiations of multivariate normal distributions that fit those three data points. So we just keep on going, keep on going, keep on going. And all of a sudden, uh, we have this integral, right? We've just computed the integral over each one of those, those uh, instantiations. And we've come up with this curve, right? That also kind of looks like a normal distribution. And now we can also see where is the uncertainty highest? Where do we just not know enough about our function? And bam, we can just put a new data point over there, right? We can sample it over there, right? So we know there's a lot of variance. And what's crazy is that even with those three data points, and this was the original function that we used, e to the uh, negative x squared minus sine x squared, we we're able to get extremely close to the true integral. And, and that, that, my friends, is actually the, the kind of if you're a statistician, kind of the jaw-dropping moment, right? Like we had only three data points and yet we got a very good approximation of at least one very significant aspect of our underlying data generating process. And so what just happened, right? Uh, essentially we've created a universal function approximator. Uh, I'm sure all of you have heard of neural networks and that's exactly what a neural network is. Except this time, instead of using neurons as like that basis function, right, that forms our universal uh, function approximator, we're just using multivariate normal distributions. And fun fact, they actually, the two things converge to the same thing, given some theorems that we're going to have to talk about now. Um, we've imposed some assumptions, but they're limited, such that the uncertainty around any value is a normal distribution. We've put in some structure that it's smooth, right? So things very smoothly, right? And it turns out that the parameters are very easily estimatable because again, we have an analytic solution. And consequently, right? We can now transform our integration problem into a Gaussian process regression problem. We've taken that very hard integral and turned it into a very simple regression. Um, and because of that, we can actually now Find, we can use the uncertainty to choose the most informative points. And this is, again, the, the key thing that we're going to get back to, and it's going to transcend in a few other places. Uh, and again, I talked about this in one dimension, but this is an example of the same thing happening in two dimensions, and you can scale this up to as many dimensions as you want. Okay, so now what does this have to do with surveys, right? Um, well, say that uh, you have multiple information choices, right? So uh, you know, there was uh, the original simulation, but I can do these, this really, this cheap one on the far right that gives me a really grainy picture, maybe something in the middle, which is okay. You know, so I have different information sources. Now, we're going to make this kind of bring this back home, right? So when I worked at the World Food Program, uh, the thing that we were, of course, most concerned about was food insecurity, right? So we have these various indices for food consumption and dietary quality. And uh, we would have uh, multiple data sources, right? So one data source would be, you can send an enumerator as we talked about earlier, you know, boots on the ground, you can send security personnel and everything else, or you can call them up, right, on their mobile phone. Uh, but the issue of course, is that uh, the mobile phone responses would be biased, right? And that bias is actually correlated with income. So say uh, we want to understand the relation between food consumption and dietary quality, and then the, um, well, on the bottom, is the per capita income. And of course, we've analyzed, we've uh, normalized this between zero and one, right? And uh, the true value that we want to learn is this thing on the bottom, right? From the face-to-face -face survey. 
but if we look at the mobile survey results, there is a bias, right? And this is kind of, and this is how it looks, right? And, and this, this bias in the middle is kind of where it's the heaviest. Um, but the cost, of course, is really cheap, right? It's way cheaper for me to call people than to send people in with, uh, you know, with their whole security personnel on the ground. Um, and by the way, in case anyone's wondering, yes, this is typical that uh, as incomes grow up, there does come to be this kind of area where when people move into urban areas, uh, we often find that their diet goes down, even if their income goes up. So that's kind of what you see this happen. And what do we do? Well, we can do exactly what we talked about earlier, right? We can apply Gaussian quadrature, right? So we use that same thing that we talked about earlier to learn the relationship, right? Between these two, uh, between these two data sources. So we're gonna learn that relationship. And then we're gonna assign a cost for evaluating each one, just we talked about. We have a function that, that uh, basically measures, okay, what is the amount of information that we're going to get from each one of these data sources as we learn about them? And now we can apply what we, what we have just learned about, right, to update that model. So this is kind of how it looks in action. Uh, what you see over here at the very top, right, are, are two kind of functions. So one, of course, is the mobile phone-based survey. At the bottom, we have the face-to-face -face survey, right? And now we're the, the, and what you see on the right, uh, is that mutual information, right? So this is the machine itself choosing which points of the curve, who do I want to sample, right? And so what it's doing is it's mostly sampling the cheap one, right? Um, occasionally sampling the one at the, the more expensive one, the face-to-face -face one, to learn about the face-to-face -face survey function. And, and this is, is why this is so revolutionary, right? We have learned the correct relationship between income and diet while using a biased, low quality data source, right? Fewer samples and far less costs. And at the bottom right, you can see the convergence, right? So we're able to see that using our technique uh, and you know, one fifth the cost, we're able to get to the same result as we would with traditional sampling methods. And they, you know, it just converges way faster. Okay, so now zoom back out a bit, right? So how do we now do this? We're talking about like making, you know, population surveys, right? We want to understand what is unemployment rate in real time due to the impact of COVID, right? These are like the kinds of questions that we're very concerned about. And, you know, we can't send, uh, you know, people everywhere to, to go and find this out, right? And so the idea is, you know, we can build a model, right? And we build a model using our multiple information sources. And this is this kind of, um, so this model, it's a Bayesian model, right? Spatial temporal Bayesian model. It's learning in time. Every single time it gets some new data, it updates itself and produces, hey, this is the best, my best view on what the world looks like today, right? And we can throw in all kinds of variables such as income and age and employment or spatial location, sex, so on and so forth. But what's really cool is now we put this all together and what we end up with is we can take this external data so let's say now we're talking about satellite data or you can talk about data on twitter which is not, which is uh you know related to maybe unemployment you can talk about all kinds of different data sources put that into the model the model itself now tells you who you need to survey it will tell people it'll tell actual government officials do interview these 100 people in this area, in this rank order, with these methods and update itself, right? The model is deriving what it needs to learn and how it needs to learn it. And then it uses that to produce a real-time, high-resolution spatio-temporal estimate of what's going on in the world. Um, and why this is so incredible is because when you think about how data on human populations is collected today, it is slow and it is not real-time and it is pretty much done in the same way that um, French military mathematicians thought of in terms of how to run their military units way back in the 1800s, right? You're talking about giant surveys that are mostly done with uh, not only feet on the ground, but using, you know, kind of tabular statistics. And what you can have over here now is you can instantiate this kind of a model and have it real time, always learning about what's going on in the population, whether it be unemployment, whether it be COVID infection rates, whether it be birth rates. Um, and what we have over here is we've applied it to Yemen, 
um, and actually learned food insecurity estimates in Yemen uh, week by week by week by week. Okay, now, um, this, uh, I'm gonna skip over this just to be a bit, uh, just to not take too much time, but I hope everyone's on the same page. This is the same idea that I was talking about earlier, uh, except what we're doing now is uh, we want to learn uh, clusters of disease and where clusters of you know certain kinds of disease outbreaks may be located, right? So this is the original data um, where we've just kind of randomly generated it. Uh, randomly, you know, you're selecting a point and doing it, but if you use a Bayesian quadrature approach, uh, by the time you've only sampled 150 of the original 825 data points, you've actually learned everything, right? And you don't need to continue anymore. And now why this is so cool, right? So why does this affect my life today? Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit now about COVID, right? And, and I'm sure at least, again, a few people in the audience have, have heard about this. This is the workhorse epidemiological model. It's called the SIR model. Um, these equations are actually not very difficult to understand, right? So what this is saying on the right is that the change in the number of people who are susceptible, right? Are, uh, it's equivalent to the, basically the, the people, the probability that you've been exposed to the disease, right? So susceptible population, and the probability that you've gotten that disease due to exposure, right? Um, so that, and so, so, you know, that's that variable beta over here. And so basically it's saying that the people flowing out of this susceptible bucket, right, are equal to this, this value over here. Um, the number of infectious uh, people over time, right, is equal to Again, this minus the probability that you've recovered from the disease, right? So this infectious bucket uh, keeps on, people are leaking out of it as they recover from it. And that is that uh, term gamma, right? Um, and then basically the, the number and then the change in the number of the people that have recovered is equal to, again, the probability that you recover from the disease times the number of people that are infectious. Um, and so you, you get these three classic curves and you know, this is epidemiology 101. Uh, and the issue, of course, is that with COVID, this is extremely hard to estimate. And that's because diagnosis rates from country to country are crazy, right? We have done an extremely poor job at actually making sure that uh, diagnosis is done uh, of testing the population. And uh, depending on country, it could be really good, really bad. Um, and even when you do test the population, it's extremely biased who gets tested. It's not random. Uh, it could be dependent upon how your doctor feels when he wakes up. Right. So um, there's a good paper about it, about, about this. But what you get over here, that that kind of pyramid like figure is basically the whole distribution of possible values of what that value, the transmission rate could be given the diagnosis rate, which, again, we don't even really know what the diagnosis rate is because that itself is extremely uncertain. So how do you solve this issue? Well, you work backwards, and that's what a very clever researcher uh, named Seth Flaxman decided to do, which is you start with the observed deaths that you that you are able to uh, see from COVID, right? And then you work backwards to attain the model parameters. And this is, of course, the uh, kind of a graphical description of the model. Um, but the unfortunately, it's extremely computationally intensive, right? These are very complex uh, Bayesian simulations, and they take you know hours upon hours to run. You really want to update them as you get new data. Um, so over here, you know, you can see kind of a figure of the, the green is kind of the results that uh, you should get uh, if you kind of had more unbiased estimators. But if you just ran the traditional SIR model, which is very fast, you get the dash lines, which are not, which again are biased. So we so we use Gaussian quadrature, right? Just what we had learned, right? To learn about the right function using the wrong function, right? From that biased SIR model, we're now able to get some very interesting information about the, uh, the model that we really want to learn about and actually estimate that correctly. And consequently, we can save lives. Uh, he was able to estimate for the various interventions, such as locking lockdowns and banning public events, what is the reduction in the infection rate that occurs um, for Netherlands, he has been, he's been producing forecasts that, uh, as you can see through 4th May, shows the reduction. Um, also, the, R, the, the reproduction number, which is the um, kind of the R0, that, that ability for the, the number of people that get infected if a person 
uh, from a person that, that has that disease. So you want to make sure it's below one. So if for every one person that gets the disease, if only 0.8 people are, are infected, the disease will die off. And as what we can see through uh, his work, we see that since 23rd March, that has been the case and indeed the disease is dying. Um, and there's a lot more. You can go to Imperial College's website and learn more about this. Um, and that concludes my talk. I have uh, one shameless plug before I open this up to questions, which is that if you like any of this stuff or are interested in what we're doing or what I'm doing, uh, please go to arboreum.dev where we're working on something very cool, which is um, creating the world's first truly decentralized credit systems, which allow individuals to borrow money, earn interest, and without banks, without any other financial intermediaries, it's through the power of swarm intelligence. I can give another talk about that some other time. Uh, find us on LinkedIn if uh, if you can. Cheers. Uh, thank you, Ma. Thank you, uh, Gaurav, for a really interesting talk. Um, um, we're now going to uh, to answer some. Uh, we're now going to let let you ask some questions. So if, if you uh, haven't already, uh, try to add some questions to the chat. Although this will be delayed. But, um, uh, so our first question: How fast is the model? How much does it depend on the amount of pre-information? Asked by Charlie. So um, it kind of depends on what you're modeling. Uh, they can be quite, so uh, one of the issues, of course, is that with more data, it becomes much more difficult to compute. Um, so I will not say these models are fast. I think the, um, the point is, is that they're fast in comparison to, let's say, having to do numerical relativity on a supercomputer. Uh, you know, now you're down to something that can be run on a modest, on a moderately powerful laptop. It may still take you like 10, 15 minutes or, uh, it may still kind of be um, pretty, pretty clunky, but yeah, you you are you're talking about, but that's and that's strictly because you know you're getting the the information the the gain from the fact that I don't have to do as many samples, right? So the real point being that instead of now having to do tens of thousands of samples in my simulation to actually get the results that I needed, I can do it in a hundred, and so that's where the, the speed improvements come from. I think tens of minutes on a on a laptop is, is pretty pretty amazing. Yeah. That that's that's very manageable, right? So I'm checking if there are any more questions. Wait. No. Um. Uh, I think this was it for questions. Um. Thank you for for giving this talk. Uh, I, I found I found it very interesting and also find it. Surprising, like the, the the starting from the background to the black holes, it was like. Uh, but um, for all our speakers, uh, wait. Um, we always um, um, have a gift uh, for our Thank speakers, you. and we always buy a comic that is. Oh, that's uh, awesome! Handpicked for our for our uh, for our speakers. In this case. Um, I have a comic about uh, uh, that has an AI subject, uh, which is called uh, the. the oh, very cool. there. I, I indeed, this is something very interested in. Uh, yeah, um, uh, one day when coronavirus lifts, uh, I will certainly. Yeah, and we, we can stay in touch. How, how best to give it to you? Uh, For sure. Either either out of uh, other future nerd night or um, by mail, whatever you want. Uh, but uh, we'll talk about that later. Yeah, we can we can certainly discuss that later. Yeah. Um, cool. I just wanted to say, uh, just to make sure I didn't uh, mislead anyone about the previous question, it certainly can take longer than fifteen minutes on a laptop. Again, just takes what kind of data yeah. you have, but uh, orders of magnitude improvements are possible. Yeah, but I, I mean. It even a day can be manageable, right? Or yeah, it depends exactly. on how, how fast you need to, to act. I mean, yeah. Right, right. Okay, uh, thank you, Gaurav. And then um, I would like, uh, uh, it's, it's time for our quiz. And I would like to give the word to, uh, uh, to Manu. Manu? 
you're muted. Um, it's the YouTube delay. So people are now you were you you were muted before, and people were only now finding out. I'm hearing that they still don't have sound even after I ask you to unmute. Um, but they can hear me, apparently. So there's something going wrong. No one can hear you. I'm getting messages by everybody. <laughs> Um, um, so I posted uh, um, uh, the link of the of the quiz um, uh, in, inside the YouTube channel, um, um, and um, um, if you go to that link, we will have a, a, 
uh, a number of solutions um, which have an A or B answer. And um, 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 you, if you answer this, uh, if you, uh, the, the person, the, uh, first we will look at the person who answers the most question correct. So there's no elimination like the, the, the British quiz in real life. Um, but if everybody has, if there are people with multiple, then the answers that are correct will be a tiebreaker. So if you know the answer, try to be as fast as possible because it might matter uh, um, about who will win. Um, um, and I suppose then, then I will, it's hard for me to ask the, actually ask the questions because I don't have access to the uh, panel. <laughs> it's weird though what, why why are, who is streaming to youtube i thought you were so why are, can people hear me but not you Uh, we will release question right now. Uh, wait a second. Again, with uh, uh, Nerd Night Smoothness, now uh, introduced in a digital age. Uh, uh, I <laughs> I hope this is well measurable uh, because I cannot see the questions and the answers. I think um, I'm afraid we'll just ha have you answer the questions because oh yeah, that that's possible. Um. So I will read the questions after Manu shares them with me through his uh, screen. Yeah, I don't have the link at hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, but the problem is also that if I join the game and I, okay, I'll answer incorrectly everything. So I'm in the quiz, but th this is still not ideal. Can you not just square, share your screen with the question? Ah, uh, yeah, of course. Uh, um, uh, so we have a an, we have an image of a of a mouse brain. Oh, fuck! <laughs> mouse ear. <laughs> okay. Uh, sorry, I I wasn't I, I wasn't taking into account that I would have to do the quiz, so I'm a. Uh, <laughs> I'm a bit um, um, of my balance, uh, uh, even more than normal. Um, so I'll not give the answers of the of the of the next questions. I will do it very smoothly and like it will it it, it will it it will go like 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 silk. The next question. So this was an uh, an image. Maybe we should just stop this. I mean, th this is terrible and not followable. For, I, 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 yeah.
Oh shit. Shit, shit, shit. How far are we through the quest? I'm hearing that the questions are growing a bit slowly. Maybe speed up a bit.
So uh, the quiz is finished. Manu? Species quiz? Okay. Um, do we have a winner? We will, uh, we will tell who, do, who is the winner at the end of the, of the show. But now um, we will first continue with uh, my part of my part of the and we'll announce the winner at the end. So please stay. Uh, and sorry for the inconvenience and the, uh, So I will share my screen. So uh, I will talk a bit um, in the light of the coronavirus, um, where we have to deal with the with with an, with a, with a disease crisis crisis quite unlike any we have um, encountered for quite some time. Um, I thought it was interesting to talk about uh, a historic crises of this nature and how people used to deal with them in terms of social distancing measures. Or other uh, uh, or and vaccines, and um, uh, I'm going to talk about two very, very uh, deadly diseases. Um, the first one I'm going to talk about is smallpox, which maybe is the most gruesome and deadly disease that has ever uh, uh, hit mankind, um, or maybe after the bubonic plague. Um, but the nice thing about smallpox is, is that it doesn't exist anymore, which is a, which is a good thing. And it's due, due to human action that it doesn't exist anymore, which makes it interesting to talk about for me. The second one I'm going to talk about is something that's more similar to a coronavirus, mostly because it is uh, the way it spreads is, is more similar to a coronavirus, and that's the flu. And um, uh, I'm going to talk about the most deadly flu pandemic, which is the, the Spanish flu pandemic in 1918. Um, so smallpox, uh, I, don't know, I don't know how much of you know, of, uh, maybe some of you have heard about it, maybe a lot of you have heard about it, but smallpox is the most, one of the most dangerous uh, diseases in our history. And there have been centuries where it killed about, it was responsible for about 10% of all deaths. Um, it starts out with a uh, with a fever, with a with a fever and vomiting, but eventually you would uh, you would develop rashes and pustules and and, and blisters, um, and the, the the most common strain, Parolia minor, minor, had a thirty percent case fatality rate, which is is not uh, which is really high, but even if you survived. Um, there was still a high chance of being disfigured, like this woman this in, in, in this picture, or, um, or getting blind. It was one of the, the, the most prominent sources of blindness. Uh, so it was really nasty. Uh, and it the devastated the new world in the, and it especially the devastated the new world uh, in the early 16th century, um, because um, it was especially severe among populations who had never experienced this disease before with a reported 90 percent death rate um, uh, um, among the first infections um, but even in the 20th century it still killed 300 million people um, to give a sense of scale that is more than all wars in the 20th century combined which is uh, quite bad so what did people do to combat this disease well for for one, they um, um, uh, they they used social distancing measures. So um, um, so they quarantined you quarantine people. They um, uh, they quarantined cities or blocks or they tried to keep away from people who, who had smallpox. Um, and uh, uh, one thing I found found, found interesting that uh, uh, one thing I found is that they uh, um, they made these hospital ships because it was too dangerous to, to have smallpox patients go to a normal hospital. 
you want to separate them from the rest of the of the populations. So they treated these, these smallpox people in these sort of ships. But um, uh, these quarantine measures were not enough to prevent the disease from spreading. And because of the extreme severity of this disease, um, uh, other measures were also taken to, uh, to prevent the, uh, the, the deaths of, of, of many innocent lives. Uh, so one thing they did, one of the earliest things they did, well, is called variolation, which is um, uh, a precursor to, uh, to vaccination. Um, um, but unlike vaccination, you actually implement the real deal into yourself. So you, 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 they, 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 they willingly, um, they willingly uh, infected young people with this horrible disease. So imagine how scary that must be. And and the idea behind behind this method is that if uh, um, depending on the amount of virus you uh, uh, you get when you are first infected, um, your immune system has more or less time to respond to it before it grows out, out of control. And by applying a very small dose of virus, um, it gives you the, your immune system the highest chance of to recover, higher than, much higher than if you would have gotten the disease from a normal patient. Um, um, so what they did was they have these, uh, uh, they, they, uh, they scraped off some of the material of dried scabs, uh, which, which come after, uh, after these postules burst. Um, and they would implement it into the nose or the skin of people, and then you got sick. Um, but this was very dangerous. Like th this must have been very scary because um, a lot of people actually still died from actual smallpox after after being uh, inoculated this way. And um, uh, um, there was another big disadvantage to this method is that because you got the actual disease, which is unlike vaccinations, you can actually always spread the disease. So um, um, when you use this method, you're putting all other people at risk around you because if they got the disease, there's a very high, uh, was a very high likelihood that you would die. Um, um, one interesting thing is that uh, uh, it was it was introduced in the in the 10th century in China and but much later in Europe, and actually one of one of the king sons of the of, of the English king actually died to bear, to this method, um, but still people were so scared of smallpox that they were willing to to do this to themselves uh, uh, to uh, to reduce the risk of dying to the actual thing. So this changed in 1796 when uh, Edward Jenner, who was a, who was a doctor, he, um, 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 after hearing stories about uh, uh, um, farmers with a farmer's wisdom that you could not um, um, be infected by smallpox after getting cowpox, he, um, he, he, he tested this out. So he was convinced that this was true. Uh, and to uh, to prove that it was true, so cowpox is much less dangerous. Um, uh, almost nobody would die from cowpox, but it transmits from cows to humans, but not from human to human. Uh, and he inoculated a, a child with cowpox, and then uh, some time later, he in, he inoculated the same child with with smallpox and found that he got no no symptoms at all. Um, and this is also where the vaccine actually gets its name because vaca means cow in Latin. Um, um, as, but scientists in those times uh, were very into uh, inoculation and they were skeptical of, about this idea at first, uh, his ideas at first, and they wouldn't even publish it. But uh, more and more doctors actually uh, implemented uh, uh, his ideas and they found it to be very effective. So this is a picture about uh, two boys of the same class, one of them um, um, with parents who were afraid of vaccination and they didn't vaccinate their child with smallpox, and one child um, um, that was uh, of the same class that was vaccinated by, by smallpox. 
And um, um, while this child also got some smallpox symptoms, they are very mild compared to the other case. And this was used uh, as a way to convince fellow scientists of the university uh, in those days that, it does, that this method was effective. Um, and the, the most beautiful thing, I think, uh, or at least um, uh, I, I'm really happy to say that um, using these vaccinations, the, the, and, and uh, uh, consecrate uh, a, a effort of the World Health Organization. Um, they actually eradicated this disease all over the world, the latest in Africa in 1977. Um, after that, there were still some labs with some uh, um, smallpox samples of, of, the, of the few places over the world for studies. Um, and actually, the very last case of smallpox came from such a lab, where um, uh, where some viral material in some way uh, uh, leaked out, and a medical student uh, was the very last person who got infected with smallpox, and she actually died from that because the virus escaped the medical lab. It's kind of scary. Um, but right now, most of those labs have closed, and there are only two left, one in America and one in Russia. Um, and uh, 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 I think it's remarkable that the, 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 the disease that used to be responsible for 10% of all deaths is now no, no, no longer a problem. Um, so I think this is a, is a great victory for mankind. Uh, and now I'm going, so the second disease I'm going to talk about um, uh, it couldn't be defeated with the vaccine. So, um, what did they? How did they? How did they handle that? And uh, what were the consequences of that? How, how did it work? Uh, so, the, the one I'm going to talk about now is the, the Spanish flu pandemic, which is the, by far the worst flu pandemic that has ever hit uh, hit our world, at least in recorded history. Um, and the estimated death toll ranges from 70 to 100 million deaths which is one to 5% of the world population, which is immense. And what was very peculiar about this disease is that it had a high mortality rate in young adults, um, which is very unusual. And for example, in coronavirus, the mortality rate is mostly high for old people, but in normal influenza, it is typically high for young, very young people and very old people. Um, um, so that, so that's, that's interesting, and I will go into that. Um, and the outbreak prevention was hampered by because it was happening during World War One. This greatly made made the disease more severe, the pandemic more severe, because um, uh, uh, participants in the war would censor their newspapers about reporting about the disease because they were afraid that news of the disease would. Uh, 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 reduce the morale of the soldiers and um, uh, would hamper recruitment drives. Uh, and so they, this, this greatly delayed any measures that, that were taken against uh, the pandemic. Um, and, and, and another big thing is that world war, war supply lines are about the, the, the best way to spread a disease and social distancing in war conditions is fairly hard, I would say. Um, so, this is a disease that mostly hits young adults. It is really odd. So here I have the case fatality rate, estimated case fatality rate of, uh, of three different diseases. The, the current coronavirus, which is the blue line. Um, uh, but there we don't know how, uh, very well how many people have it. We have, in orange, we have the Spanish flu uh, 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 line. And in green, the normal flu line. And um, you can see that around the age of 29, there's a weird peak in, 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 the, in the fatality of this disease. Um, and there's, uh, uh, for a long time, they thought it was due to the fact that this strain of the flu would uh, trigger an immune reaction that would kill, make your immune system kill yourself. Um, um, also called uh, cytokine storm. And it's also sometimes mentioned in, in Corona that, 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 that this is a thing that happens in Corona. Um, but there's a big problem with that. And that's that, why would it then peak? So the, the idea is, is that young people have stronger immune systems and are more 
likely to be killed by those stronger immune systems. But why then would it peak at 29 years? Uh, so there's a different, uh, a, a different theory, more recent, um, because flu pandemics is something that happens every 25 years roughly. Um, and um, what can happen is that if you are hit part particularly severely by a strain of flu that is significantly different from, uh, 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 from a later strain of flu. So in, in, 90, in, 89, in 80, 1889, um, there was a really bad Russian flu pandemic like, uh, like this one. Um, um, and what happens, uh, what the idea is, is that um, um, the defense, the, the immune system, when encountering the Spanish flu, would make antibodies against the old flu strain instead of the new flu strain, prefer, uh, 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 and so that the antibody, the, the, the immune system response against the new flu strain was suppressed. And one way that they showed that, uh, 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 that this was a likely cause, was like here you have the death rate as a function of birth year in gray of the Spanish flu which uh, peaks at a certain date during the, the which is it's, it's just after the previous flu pandemic. And what you can see is, is they also, so they can measure the antibodies against this previous flu strain. And they found that it was peaking around the same year. So the more antibodies you had against this flu strain, the weaker you, the more likely you were to die to this flu strain, which, uh, which I found uh, a remarkable research. Uh, I would recommend reading it. Um, so what did people do to combat this disease? So um, there, there was no vaccination uh, during all the time of the disease, um, not only because it was, uh, uh, the flu, the, the, it was a new strain where a new vaccine had to be developed, but also because people thought that flu was caused by bacteria. Um, and uh, uh, um, um, it is not, it's caused by a virus, but viruses were too small to see with a microscope. And they they developed a vaccine against this bacteria, um, but it didn't work at all, obviously. Um, so vaccination was out of the question. So instead, people implemented like like these days, they implemented social distancing measures. So uh, wash your hands before eating. And influenza, frequently complicated with pneumonia, is pre prevalent at this time throughout America. This theater is cooperating with the Department of Health. You must do the same. If you have a cold and are coughing and sneezing, do not enter this theater. Go home and go to bed until you are well. It sounds sort of familiar. Um, but the nice thing about, or nice uh, thing is that there's, from the United States, there's actually a lot of data on how this, uh, 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 um, um, how these social distancing measures helped or not. And so there's a research in 2007 that looked at uh, uh, the, 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 the non-pharmaceutical interventions in, in US cities and looked what the result was in the death rate. So um, uh, there are four cities in this graph. I would like to start with, with the first one is, is a city that's Pittsburgh. And in Pittsburgh, they, they responded very late to the crisis and they, they, they implemented very little social distancing measure, measures. And what they found is that Pittsburgh has by far the highest uh, uh, mortality rate as percentage of the population uh, of all American cities. Um, well, uh, and then you have, for example, New York City, where they, uh, where they did implement str uh, uh, strict measures. And there you can see that um, uh, while the death rate is still fairly high, it's much lower than in Pittsburgh. Um, uh, like here in black, you can, these lines below are, are when measures were implemented. Um, so, um, but the most interesting thing was when they showed how it worked when people stopped uh, um, uh, socially distancing measures in between during the pandemic. And, um, um, this is what you can see here for two cities. Um, you can see that at first the, the number of people who are dying is rising, and then they implemented social distancing measures and the amount of people who were dying was going down. But then as the, the people, the, the, the rate of people dying was going down, they stopped using the, the, the social distancing measures 
and you can see that that uh, um, uh, the amount, the, the rate of, of deaths almost rebounds immediately in all these cities. And these are just four cities from this, but this is a trend that you can see over all cities that they've taken in this data set. Uh, and it's, uh, yeah, I thought it was, it was kind of interesting. So for this disease, they never found a vaccine, but uh, so how did it end? How did this, how this pandemic end? Um, um, so for that, uh, uh, I have this graph where you can see a very high peak in death rates uh, in, 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 in the first year. But at some point, uh, uh, actually, uh, they got to a point of herd immunity where about a third of the people uh, uh, had had the disease and were immune. And the disease could not spread fast enough anymore to, uh, to, uh, to, to cause this, the same death rates as before. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, this was my presentation. Uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And uh, I am open for questions. <laughs> Okay, um, thank you a lot, Anna, for your presentation. Um, oh, I'm so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, let's be dark or how can I behind you? I might. Yeah, I myself have a question for you actually. You show the story of four, like the tale of four cities, where yeah. how can I say different city have different measure of social distancing, and some city actually like uh, remove the measure, and then uh, you see like the second peak are uh, for the case with the uh, flu. So I can see right now there are some European country actually like are actually easing the measure a little bit. Do you expect the same to happen? are in Europe? Um, to some extent, yes. Um, I must say that the measures they took in those days on average were less severe than the one the state took now because they were completely unavailable. Uh, uh, like they were in wartime, they were fighting a world war. So um, just stopping all business was not really an option because um, um, uh, the manufacturing of weapons and the recruitment of people still continued. So um, um, the severity of the social distancing measures was a bit less strict than it is now for obvious reasons. So yes, they are easing now, but like I am sure that that, that this would happen if, if, they, if they got rid of all the social distancing measures. I am, I am fairly conf confident that this would likely, that this is likely to happen. Um, um, but it, so it depends on how far they go, I would say. <laughs> they need to keep the R0 too close so that the, 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 the amount of persons you're spread to, if it stays close to one, it, it doesn't go completely out of control, but it needs to be below one or close to one, I suppose. Yeah, I agree. And also, I think maybe mass tests, like some country already apply, like South Korean. It is what? South. Yeah, South. Or I think also mass doing some blanket tests. So that's just everybody or random test would have to uh, to lower the R zero or as what you say, the number of people who have the virus. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. because some people already have it. Uh, they know of it, and then they stay at home. Um, we don't have other questions so far, so I think uh, you can take over the host, please. Yeah, um, uh, oh, uh, thank you for listening to my talk, I suppose. Um, and then I'm really happy to announce our third, to introduce our first, third speaker, uh, Sandrine, who is going to talk about how bacteria can help us. Go, Sandrine. You're muted. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Anne. <laughs> now I got the sounds. 
Yeah, welcome everybody for the third part of this uh, great life experiment <laughs> full of surprises. <laughs> so let's uh, share my screen so that I can show you my talk. If I manage now, right now, okay. Yes, so I will uh, have a story that is more positive than what we hear all the time uh, with the real uh, bacteria virus that is attacking us. So let's share the screen first. Yeah, so I'm uh, Sandrine Dan. Uh, I'm a scientist, and I work uh, with uh, yeah photosynthesis, and uh, now recently uh, with bacteria. I have some background in there, and uh, yeah, I want to present to you uh, this microorganism that we can't see the good, the bad, but the beauty, not the ugly. And yeah, I hope we can end up with a <laughs> nice, <laughs> nice, nice uh, positive attitude after this talk. Yeah, so what is microorganism is something that we can see and what is that is bacteria is the virus that we uh, hear about now it can be also, also little fungi mold microalgae little creature that we uh, call protozoa actinomyces uh, spores uh, are also forms of uh, dormant form of life like seeds and pollen and all this is in the air it's found in the soil in the water but also in our body and uh, yeah is that microbiota good or bad? It's everywhere and we have to deal with that. So we have no choice somewhere. We are a bit uh, now afraid of this because it's a very unknown thing that we can't see. And uh, yeah, in the past, as Anne just said now, we had uh, some pandemic and uh, yeah, we have a not a very positive opinion somehow about bacteria because they can make us sick. So yeah, they can indeed be quite ugly but I will show you that, in fact, they are also very good and very important because we can't, in fact, live without. So these bacteria that uh, I'm talking about uh, now, uh, spe specifically that are in our body, are very important to us. So they are on our skin, inside us, in our guts, and it's actually a lot of them because if you consider the amount of bacteria compared to the amount of cells in our body, it's 10 cells of bacteria for one cell of our body. Of course, by weight, uh, we are luckily more heavy, but I think we can consider it as uh, like the size of our head. And these bacteria are very good for us because they help us to digest our food. They actually could influence obesity. There is uh, research uh, uh, showing that. They protect uh, us from infections, in fact, because they are a layer that is there and to protect us. And in fact, they have a very big role in their immune system. And moreover, this is a very important thing that we have discovered now is that uh, bacteria can influence our mood. And uh, yeah, they are like part of us, like I'm saying, and they can influence our mood and the good bacteria for sure get us in a good mood. And actually, we, uh, we know about bacteria since quite long, and we have domesticated them, like it's shown on this picture here. We have uh, indeed uh, fermentations that we are using since long to keep food. It's since the Neolo Neolithic uh, age, and uh, yeah, we preserve the food with that. And there are probiotics, and this is actually super healthy it improves and restores our gut flora so actually if you have an antibiotic treatment you need to eat maybe cheese <laughs> and yeah so the dairy products are preserved like this so you have the milk and then you keep it as a yogurt it's a very good way to keep yogurt you have all kind of uh, milk products that are kept like that and of course as a french uh, person myself i will say that it's really great that we can make cheese thanks to bacteria and also bacteria fermented uh, since long, uh, we have uh, yeah, discovered by accident, I suppose that uh, some uh, how uh, grapes uh, got fermented and became a, a, a drink that makes some kind of effect on us. Uh, so like wine and beer, it's a fermentation. And well, just want to say that uh, alcohol, uh, yeah, that uh, it's not something that uh, some people think that uh, beer and wine in the past was there because it's a very good thing to uh, to be there if you don't have clean water but actually uh, it dehydrates your body so we would not advise to drink too much uh, wine of course and there is also kombucha that is a fermented tea and i'm working on this uh, actually i will talk a little bit about this uh, later on 
And well, just want to say that uh, alcohol is not a good thing. So the, all this spray with alcohol, yeah, as a biologist, I'm not really in favor of that. And uh, yeah, so a very big, big thing for me as well, uh, thanks to bacteria is the bread. And uh, I have a lot of experience making my own bread and uh, make it from sourdough. And it's just spontaneous fermentation uh, of uh, flour. And it works very well. And uh, in the past, people also kept uh, lots of vegetables uh, thanks uh, to fermentation. And still today, I hope so. And uh, so if you go to the bacteria from where they are, uh, it's in the soil, so there is life in the soil, and these microorganisms are very important. They help the plants to grow. So as you know, compost is the decomposition of the soil, and that's through bacteria. And this bacteria then release uh, nutrients for the plants, and it's a very important uh, role, and that's why in agriculture now people should consider that um, more. If you want to do permaculture, for example, you know about that. And uh, yeah, they also protect against path pathogens from the plants and pollutants. And it's a complete symbiosis between the plants and uh, these bacteria because the uh, bacteria, they give nutrients to the plants. And there's also some benefits, of course, from the bacteria. So there's also bacteria in the air. And that's a very big topic that I'm working on now. And uh, this airborne bacteria is from, uh, yeah, it's formed through vapors. Uh, clouds, wind, and thin particles. So all this uh, is in the air, and it transports pollen seeds, uh, and of course, bacteria and viruses. There is also fungi and mold, and this is uh, especially found uh, above uh, ground. But when you go above uh, water, which is a big part of Earth, you find microalgae in the air. And all these uh, microbes are a little bit unknown because it's uh, quite difficult to grow them. But since we can analyze DNA, we have new type of uh, bacteria that we are slowly discovering. So is this uh, bad, this bacteria in the air? Well, I would say the bad guy is maybe not the bacteria, but that person is holding the Petri dish because as a human, as you can know, uh, we discuss a lot about this in the news and uh, yeah, there's a lot of pollution from us uh, that is coming uh, there and uh, bacteria are actually, uh, quite uh, important for the nature, but we uh, have a bit of a big impact, I'm afraid. <laughs> and yeah, now that uh, we are all a little bit uh, home, you can uh, see that this air quality is, uh, is a little bit improving. Actually, according to NASA, this, uh, this is actually very improving. And this pollution comes from industry, from human activity, uh, this is uh, no doubt. And this is uh, why I want to tell really here strongly that this bacteria that we find in the air is not maybe the bad uh, part of it. And uh, yeah, so the uh, air inside doors is uh, now quite uh, something important that I want to uh, tell you is that uh, if you consider the air inside, uh, it's actually the worst quality of air, but we spend 90% of our time inside. So there are microbes, but uh, since we live in houses that are not made of uh, natural, uh, yeah, natural uh, components, you have also volatile organic compounds that are coming from the buildings, from what we uh, use in the house, furnitures, and cleaning products. And this has a big influence uh, on uh, our health, though we don't die immediately from it, but at the long term. And, uh, yeah, this is something that uh, we'll explain a bit further, but yeah, it uh, plays uh, a big role on um, hormones and on uh, yeah, cancer. And so this is found in the air in the house uh, through dust. And of course it comes from humans too, because when we breathe uh, our air or skin, yeah, this is uh, of course a source of bacteria. But uh, if you talk about quality of air, yeah, there's also a lot of uh, influence from the city, so all pollutant from the, the activities of humans, uh, CO2. And uh, yeah, there is also a lot of microplastic that uh, people have analyzed in the air of cities. And this is coming uh, also from our textile, not just uh, the microplastic that are found from uh, uh, yeah, plastic disintegrated, disintegrated somewhere else, but from our clothes. And there's also uh, chemistry from the furniture and the surroundings. So just what I said uh, before and yeah, what to do against that. Yeah, open the windows. 
and uh, yeah, use uh, friendly natural products. So it's good to be clean, but uh, don't think that bacteria are all our enemies. It's also important to keep them, like I just said before. And uh, yeah, what I'm working now on is to replace this uh, organic material, uh, well, to replace all this chemistry that is not so healthy with organic material that supports uh, actually healthy microbes uh, in our biodomes. And uh, yeah, I just also want to uh, say that uh, if you play in the dust, uh, uh, in the outside in the in the ground, yeah, it's actually pretty good for you. And uh, we are somehow maybe too clean, and this pollution around uh, gives us maybe allergy, and uh, play a lot uh, with our immune system. And so I, I think it's very important to get connected to nature and maybe put our hands in the ground. Uh, so how to cultivate the bacteria and maybe uh, influence uh, our environments? Uh, so all bacteria, they don't just grow everywhere. They have very specific environments. So for example, if you have oxygen or not, according to the temperature, the pH, the substrate, uh, so some uh, bacteria will preferably grow on us uh, than outside. And then, yeah, you can also like, uh, talked about before, you can do fermentation and uh, uh, this fermentation are mostly known from the past from airborne microorganisms. But if you uh, look at uh, the products that we buy now, it's uh, selected cultures and they are pure and uh, yeah, we control uh, this bacteria because then we, we have a full control of the flavor and the process uh, of bread making, for example, or wine. Well, bacteria growth, uh, just to give you an extra information, uh, as soon as you give uh, food to bacteria, they grow exponentially. So from one, you get two and four and eight. And then as soon as there is no food for them or the environment is not good, then uh, yeah, they will just de yeah, or decompose or just not grow anymore. And so one project I'm working on, it's uh, a new material somehow that is uh, made from bacteria and it's uh, bacteria cellulose. Cellulose is basically from plants. And uh, you have, um, yeah, uh, this is called the uh, kombucha tea. And uh, this bacteria uh, come from Asia and it's a mixture of bacteria and yeast. And this uh, cellulose that is made by uh, this bacteria, some people might know, uh, it's a, uh, yeah, it makes a film around above the tea. So it's just tea and sugar and this bacteria, you put them in and then you get this material that you see on the, on the drawing here. And uh, yeah, this is called a SCOBY, like semiotic culture of bacteria and yeast. And compared to the cellulose that is made from plants, it's very pure, it's quite strong. It can be shaped and uh, yeah, it's a very wet material. So it increases has a very uh, big holding capacity of water. And uh, yeah, it's uh, something we are trying to make new things without, but uh, with it, but I will not <laughs> tell you now all the secrets that are coming now from the labs. And uh, yeah, we want anyway to give a good perception about uh, this bacteria and the material too, to give a good idea about that. And then to, uh, we, well, get a good smell because bacteria also can smell. Well, actually this uh, kombucha don't smell uh, bad because you can even buy the drink. But it's a little bit, uh, if you have it very strong, it's a little bit like a vinegar because actually it has a, a low pH. So it's a bit uh, acid, like fermentation of uh, vegetables. And the aspect of it, as you can see on this picture, <laughs> can be a little bit uh, scary, but see, we are uh, trying to color it. So as you see on this drawing there, you can even make food with it. So we are trying to explore all the potential and benefits of this uh, uh, material. And um, yeah, we are working on that. and. Uh, uh, some other people are uh, working on bacteria to make electricity. And actually I found a, a new technique, uh, didn't go really into details, but it looks like uh, people are uh, finding a way to make new, bacteria, a new, new battery from bacteria. And uh, yeah, I invite you to go further with, uh, with this uh, project. Uh, maybe we will try to talk about it in another night. And, uh, to end this talk, I just want to present to you something that is also really great is that uh, bacteria, you can make art with it. So uh, if you have a look on these uh, drawings, well, pictures here that I'm showing, uh, these are made by uh, bacteria that are fluorescent. So I put the name of the artist. I don't know them personally. I found that actually on the internet. And uh, yeah, somebody has also made uh, what is called the algae graphy. So it's like pictures that are made uh, thanks to uh, algae. 
So they they really managed to make a print uh, uh, like a photo paper with the algae because uh, this algae there they are able to move to the light, and so you can make pictures with that. In the past, actually, uh, some um, uh, algae were used to uh, print uh, pictures. And uh, yeah, to just want to end with another one uh, picture that I found that is really beautiful. It's uh, from Vani Vanina Kiova, and uh, she managed to make a Van Gogh about, uh, well, from bacteria, just growing bacteria. And with that, I want to end my talk, and I hope that I uh, got you to get you to think that bacteria are not our enemies, but also our friends. And I hope that everybody will keep safe, and, uh, and I hope you enjoy the talk, and thanks for your attention. I, I hope you have some questions. I will maybe give back the floor to my uh, colleagues here. And let's see where we are with the colleagues here. Da, da, da. Thanks. Yes, and I, I maybe I should, I should tell uh, something, uh, a, a great news that we have now. Because uh, to, to end uh, the, well, I think that the people want to know about um, what happened with the, uh, with the quiz. Because I have some information about that. Ooh. So I have the winner, uh, the information, the name of the winner here. And the winner is Elisa. So Elisa, I don't know if uh, people hear me actually, uh, Anna. Because I'm not too sure that uh, yes, that sound okay, good. Because I don't see myself green, so I'm a bit wondering. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so Elisa will get the mug, and if Delicious. she can contact us uh, via our webpage uh, on Facebook or uh, yeah, we are hopefully visible on the net in Nerta Night Amsterdam, and we hope that uh, soon we will uh, get a new session, in, not on internet, but live at here in Amsterdam. And I hope you enjoy, uh, well, actually, uh, maybe ha there are questions. Uh, do you know that, uh, Anne? Yes, we have two questions. First okay, question, um, are bacteria in our space possible? What, space, like space, like, well, can you repeat inner space? Um, space like outside Earth? Um, I am not sure, but uh, uh, I can ask. Try to see if I uh, can see the question also on YouTube. Da -da -da. Well, I mean, outside Earth, uh, it's pretty cold, so I'm not too sure that uh, life uh, is what present. About outer, outer space. Outer space. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, there's a big uh, theory that actually life on Earth comes from space, and that could be uh, that could be from uh, yeah rock that where there were bacteria that survived the trip basically. So that's all I can uh, I can say uh, because I am not a space space explorer. <laughs> it depends if they can survive, and actually in space uh, there is no air, but it's pretty cold, and uh, yeah. If they can survive to this low temperature, why not? Do we have another question? Yeah, we have another question. Um, what is the taste of kombucha? Aha, uh -huh, very good question. <laughs> well, I like it. For me, it's like cider, so I make it myself. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's like cider. Uh, it depends how far you grow it. So you can buy the Scooby and you can uh, do that yourself. It's just tea and sugar, so it's pretty easy to make. And uh, yeah, you have uh, in the in the shops uh, kombucha drinks, but really? yeah, they are industrial, so I don't know if the taste is very close to the truth. <laughs> the next time I have a party, uh, if I if you come to my party, I, I always bring yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. drinks, and I always bring kombucha. <laughs> and I actually have also spirulina behind me, and this is uh, my other bacteria friend. <laughs> And this tastes actually like a very neutral. Other question, Anne? I think this was the last question and I don't have any okay. more. So uh, thank you, Sandrine. You're welcome, thank, thank you. So um, and with that, we think we're coming to the end of the nerd hack. I think everybody who is still in this, uh, 
um, for 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 for, uh, for staying with us even through the the somewhat bumpy quiz. Um, and I hope uh, I will see you uh, at the next Nerd Night, which is the 19th of June. Um, 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 well, we're not. Like, we'll see what we'll do with that. But if, if it goes through, I hope to see you there. And um, um, if you know people who are good at giving a talk, then we are also very interested in uh, in. Uh, in contact, if, if you could contact us, uh, uh, if you can give us their contact information, because we're always looking for new speakers. Um, and that is, is there anything else? Uh, okay. Oh yeah, and um, uh, the, the, the winner should contact us because then we will uh, um, figure out how to uh, uh, give the winner the mark to you. It's a great way to show off. <laughs> yeah, don't and that's people it. Say me anyway, but <laughs> OK. Can you show the name one more time? <laughs> yes, very true. Because in case uh, we lost uh, the, <laughs> the, or the, or the, the the person, it's Elisa. Elisha. Yeah, well, I don't know. I think it's Alicia, but uh, yeah. <laughs> I know Alicia. If, if it's you a, know her? Or not a okay, it could be. I will see if you know her even better. <laughs> okay. And thanks, Garaf, too. And thanks, Anne, for the talk. Yeah, thanks, Garaf, especially. So I, I guess we can say bye-bye. <laughs>